It's where we're going to pick up tonight. Yes, we're going to finish the text tonight. Next week, I want to come back and just kind of review, I mean, you know, 50 chapters, but you've talked about creation, the flood, you've had the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and last is jo Joseph. Just to kind of, you know, is it important for us just to be thinking about it and, and review a little bit of what we did learn? So that's what we'll do next week. And then in two weeks, we're not going to meet until the 22nd of September. And then we'll start Revelation, the bookends of the Bible. And I guess we'll work our way in. So that means finish Revelation, do Exodus. Then we'll do, you see, Jude. No, we will not do that. All right. Uh, verse 28, chapter 49. We are at, uh, of course, Jacob had prophesied, basically, concerning each son, uh, and now he's ready to die. Uh, Jacob is, going, is 147 when he dies. Isaac, his father, was 180, and Abraham was 175. Anybody know anybody live close to that nowadays? Uh, I don't even think even 147 comes close anymore. I've heard, it seems like I've read somebody who was about 120 in their teens. They might have lied about their age, but I didn't question. All right, verse 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. That's where he's just finished going through, give, kind of prophesying, blessing them. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, everyone, with the blessing appropriate to him. Remember the oldest one? He, he got knocked down because of what he did and goes down. Joseph gets double blessing because he was favorite son and so forth. So it was appropriate to the individual son. 29, then he charged them and said to them, I'm about <clears throat> to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that was in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham brought, bought along the field from Ephron the Hittite for a burial site. There he buried Abraham, uh, there they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebecca, and there I buried Leah. Remember, his favorite was not Leah, right? But Rachel, but she died before they got there in childbirth with Benjamin. But Leah, who, who's her son that's turned out to rise to prominence, you remember? Starts with a J, ends with an H, the U, D, A, and in the middle. Judah! Oh, see, I, and I didn't think I'll get that. Yeah, Leah is the one who's buried, and of course, Judah is number four, no, three on the list of sons born. So maybe it's coincidence. Uh, the field, verse 32, in a cave that is in it, purchased from the sons of Heth. Then Jacob finished charging his sons. He drew his feet into the bed and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. I always found it interesting that Abraham was the one who's given the promise of the promised land, the land of Canaan. He didn't own anything except for a burial site. Him and Sarah are buried there. Isaac and Rebecca are buried there. Leah and Jacob will be buried there. And so, years later, guess who else comes in? We'll see before we finish tonight or the next chapter. So, verse 50, uh, chapter 50, verse 1, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed. Remember, they had really did have a close relationship. He was daddy's favorite, but he loved his daddy. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. 
So the physicians embalmed Israel, Jacob. Forty days were required for, uh, for it, for such a period required embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. So 40 days to embalm, and they wept for 70. It's been a long time ago. I read about what they do to embalm. It's not like the embalming we do today. They take out certain organs. They, of course, drain all fluids and kind of dry the body, various things. And, of course, they wrap it very tight if you've ever seen a mummy or even a picture of a mummy. And so it does take time because this is not the 20, 20th or 21st century when they did this. So they didn't have a lot of the modern things where you could probably embalm somebody the Egyptian way quicker. But you know, they find those mummies thousands of years later in good shape. Of course, if they were to cut them open, they'd probably fall apart since the air hit them, but the bodies are still there. So, pretty good. So, um, verse 4, when the days of mourning for him were passed, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, you know, I found favor in your sight. Please speak to Pharaoh, saying, my father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up, bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph, remember, he's really still number two in command years after the famine uh, is over with. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up. I didn't realize this until I was reading this. Joseph went, and all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. That's a lot of people. But what is it? what it showed to me is that's a lot of respect for somebody who wasn't an Egyptian. It's a lot of respect for Joseph. All the household of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household, they left only their little ones and their flock and their herds in the land of Goshen. So can you imagine you're a Canaanite? This is not, you know, a small little burial uh, wall to bury somebody. This is a herd of people coming up through your land to bury somebody. They weren't necessarily brandishing spears and swords, but they probably somehow could tell it was to bury somebody. A lot of maybe mourning still going on. Verse 9. Uh, there also went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. Yeah, it was. When they came to the threshing floor of a tide which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there for a very great and sorrowful, with very great and sorrowful lamentations, and observed seven days of mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, uh, they said, this is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore it was named Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. Now this is the part I could not figure out. All right, you have Egypt, Mediterranean Sea, Israel's here, but the Jordan River's over here. So if it's beyond the Jordan, to me it's on that side. But he's going to be buried on this side. The one possibility, if you, when you're reading and it's talking about the city of Jerusalem, and it's like, you know, uh, in Israel, Jericho is north and Jerusalem is here. And they say they go down to Jericho. Would you say that's down or up? The reason they say down is... 
uh, Jerusalem's on top of the mountain. So they have to go down the mountain to Jericho. So it could simply be when they say beyond the Jordan, they are still referring to this side. Either they came and swung, or which would be a, a long way, or it's just the phraseology from one language to another. But it, as I said, when I read it, it's like it doesn't make sense. And I did not see anything that said it was on the other side of the Jordan. So. Uh, verse 12, thus his sons did for him as he charged them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mary, which Abraham had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. So, dad is dead. They're on their own. Verse 15, Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead. They said, what Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him. Now, this was going to do a little math. And I'm not good, so I'll need help. Jacob died at the age of 147. He was presented to Pharaoh at the age of 30. So that's 17 years. Uh, it had been, let's see, Joseph was 30 when he was presented to Pharaoh about his dreams. 17 when uh, he was sold. So that's 13 years. So right there, you've got you know, 30 years. But they were two years into the famine before they came. So that's nine years. Seven years of feast, two years into the famine. 39 years later, from the time his brothers sold him as a slave. I've heard of people holding grudges for a long time. This isn't a grudge, it's fear. They had no idea what little brother was going to become in about 13 or so years. So 39 years later, they are fearing what Joseph might do to them. And as it says, I underlined it, that he might pay us back in full. So, what has Joseph done since they've been there in Egypt that might make them think he would try and get even? He's been good to him. Yeah. Exactly. It's you come on. Here's what you tell Pharaoh. You're gonna, we'll put you over here, the lush part of the land. He gave them, even when they, he was still disguising himself, he gave them their money back plus full sacks of feed. Yeah, it made them a little nervous, and I can understand why. But he was testing them. You know, his dad's still alive. He was trying to learn things from them. But he hadn't done anything. I mean, even when they're all 12, there at daddy's bedside he had nothing to do with what his father or their father was saying as far as the blessings or prophecies about each one he came up and daddy double blessed him but they're fearing yeah that's what guilt does to us can you imagine how those ten brothers felt Hopefully they, they felt bad selling him, you know, 30 seconds later. They really felt bad when they saw where he was and what he could do to them when they realized, you know, he's second in command. But then it's the way he treated them from that point forward. So, <clears throat> verse 
verse 16. Here's what they come up with. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, uh, your father, not our father, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin for they uh, did you wrong. Now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And then Joseph wept when they spoke to him. First off, it's not like Joseph didn't have an opportunity to talk to his father and his father say, forgive your brothers. He was there 17 years. You know, he could have said it for himself. Joseph, I think, one of the reasons he wept was he could see that they feared, see that they were lying, and they just didn't get it. We're coming up on one of my favorite verses in Genesis, verse 18. Then his brothers also came, so they sent a message, now they come physically. They came, fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? If you, the first four words, do not be afraid. How many times in the Gospels does Jesus says, do not fear, do not be afraid? Numerous. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. This is what we see Joseph telling his brothers. Do not fear. I am not God. How are they treating him? Aren't they kind of treating him like God? They're bowing down before him. We'll be your servants. They're kind of treating him like God. He knew it. Verse 20. As for you, this is the verse I love. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You ever had something bad happen in your life that turns out for good? When you're in the middle of the bad, did you think God was going to turn it for good? Probably not. But can God turn bad into good? Yeah. He can do anything he wants to. You know, they said, we have to go through the troubled times in life so that it makes us stronger. You know, we may not, we don't like going through the troubled times, but it will make us stronger if we trust in God. So you've got Joseph who was sold as a slave. What happened? God raised him up. Then he's put in jail. God raises him up. Um, he could see God's hand at work, but the brothers do not. It, it's what was the. Uh, yeah, good. <clears throat> so, does God still take bad and turn it into good today? Sure. Yeah, I I, I think back. Uh, 1992, 93. Stop thinking. I think it was 93. Uh, I had an older brother who was 10 years older than I am. I, you know, growing up, I, I basically idolized him. I, you know, I was his shadow. He died of a brain tumor in 93. But as a result of that, he worked for a mission board in Richmond, Virginia. He was an accountant wasn't a missionary, but he, he did the taxes for the missionaries and, and anything else along that line. And so I got to thinking, well, you know, that's how my brother was serving God, his way. What can I do? It made me become a little bit more active uh, in the church, but it also opened the door for me to listen to God more and God to work in my life. Of course, it did lead to me end up here going through a whole lot in uh, since then. 
But my point being, that was a bad time. But God used it for good in my life. You know, we could probably all sit back and go, yeah, this was a bad time, but God turned it and used it for good. Maybe not great, but God will use it for good. So, past, hmm, I guess probably more than 18 months now, uh, in this world, really, at least in our country, it's been a bad time. Anybody want to argue that point? I hope not. Can God use it for good? What's he going to do? We don't know. Just think, you know, it'd be like Joseph when he's down in that pit. He didn't know what God was going to do. He didn't know if it was going to turn out for good or bad. But he had to trust God. And, and if I was to tell anybody, if, if this pandemic, Lord, don't let it happen, was to go on another year, if the numbers were to rise back where they were the first part of the year, Trust God. He'll take bad and use it for good. So, all right, it's back to the story. Brothers, fear him. And Joseph says, you don't get it. Yes, you meant to do bad, but God meant it for good. It was intended for Joseph to go through all he did. It strengthened him. It made him be the leader who he was. Because he kept depending on God. So, verse 21, Therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now, Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household. Joseph lived only 110 years. Isn't that a shame? He only lived to be 110. You know, not 180 like Isaac or... Uh, 47 like his father. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Also, the sons of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, were born on uh, Joseph's knees. Joseph, what was that? Um, my note says on Joseph's knees probably indicates that he adopted them. So whether their daddy disappeared or died or whatever, we don't know. But that is the understanding of born on Joseph's knees. Joseph, verse 24, said to his brothers, and it's probably not his brother since he's one of the younger ones, but family. Uh, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. So, here's my question. Did they do what Joseph wanted? Joseph said, carry me back because God is going to keep the promise he gave to Abraham over 100 plus years ago that they would own the land, that they would return to land. In fact, God told Abraham, you'll be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But Joseph believed God's word. So he says, carry me back, carry my bones back. Did they? Yes. How do you know? Some preacher told you? Sunday school lesson? Exodus 13. Is it Exodus 13? Okay, I'll let you look it up. It might be there. It's also in Joshua 24, 32. Mm -hmm. 30, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, but if you go over to Joshua, they've entered the land. Last chapter, 24, verse 32. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem in the peace of the 
grounds Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor and the father of Shechem for a hundred pieces of money. And they came and they became the heritage of Joseph's sons. Anyway, there you know they buried him in the same place. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Leah, Jacob, and now Joseph. I've said this over and over. The Bible only tells us what it wants us to know, what we need to know. It doesn't give us all the details. But you can read it and see God keeps his word. God can take bad and turn it into good. God can take and do just about any, or he can do anything he wants to. You talk about bad to good, Jesus died on a cross. Seemed like a bad time, didn't it? All the apostles were very downtrodden. What happened? He rose from the grave on the third day. Boy, that was better than good. That was great. Think about Lazarus. How did his sister Mary and Martha say, Jesus, if you'd only been here, he wouldn't have died. You're late. You're late. I can't imagine how those two ladies felt when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, and he come walking out. He went from bad to great. That's how God works, from bad to great. Yeah, Hines has gone through its bad times. Great lies ahead. How can I say that? I've seen plenty of churches to be in terrible times, but because you trust in God, keep seeking him and following him, it turns out great. Anybody, any questions? Just a comment. Yes. I can't see you. <laughs> All right.